Thank you for sharing your time here, wherever you're at, wherever you're calling in from. Um, on behalf of the Wild, we're so happy to be sharing the next 45 minutes or so for you here with our Mixed with the Wild series. Um, today specifically focus on having more effective and experiential design processes. Um, just under, really quickly, who is the Wild? What do we do? The Wild is an immersive collaboration platform. We own two products, both the Wild and Iris VR. And our goal is just to make building smarter from all the way from ideation to coordination through a variety of different immersive tools. The Wild being more focused on prototyping and collaboration, as well as immersive pre presentations. And then Iris VR focused on design reviews, issue tracking, BIM coordination, getting a, that idea closer to the end of construction. Today for our webinar, Mixed with the Wild, we're so fortunate to be joined by representatives of Leo A. Daly, one of the top architecture design building companies in the world, most recently recognized, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, but number 16 of Architectural Record Magazine in the world, which is an understatement for the diversity and variety of innovative work that you all do. I'm just going to very quickly introduce a little more about Liu A. Daly, the speakers that we'll be having here. If you all can bear with me, I know no one likes hearing their bios read off, but it is important for the context of this, this conversation here. Um, Liu A. Daly is focused in planning, architecture, engineering, and interior design. And since 1915, Liu A. Daly has had an unyielding focus on excellence to create exceptional spaces. We're joined by Ryan D. Martin, AIA and NCARB, as the Vice President, Director of Design of Leo A. Daly. Mr. Martin has an extensive experience of projects ranging from boutique hotels and luxury resorts to convention centers and urban business hotels, as well as master planning, major mixed use developments. We're going to hear a lot of Ryan's expertise on pioneering some of this immersive technology being used at Liu A. Daily and how it just allows them to bring it to more experiential design. As well, we're joined by Ryan Christensen, AIA and NCARB, project architect at Leo A. Daily. Ryan has bringing his valuable problem solving skills to the team and is always looking for creative solutions. He employs his mastery of visualization tools to help the client and see three dimensionally and fully understand the design before any construction begins. Ryan C is a bit of the brains behind the operations with engaging some of this virtual and immersive technology is at Leo A. Daily, as we'll be hearing. But finally, we're also joined today by AJ Lightheart, AEC Immersive Technology Consultant at The Wild. A a AJ has been a technology leader in the EC industry for the past 11 years. As a trusted advisor for SMB to ENR top 500 companies, AJ has consistently found a passion for connecting technology to a practical ROI. AJ, as our host here today, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you. Thank you all for joining. And AJ, feel free to kick us off, off our conversation here. No, thank you, Austin. And let me just say, again say, Ryan and Ryan, very much appreciative of you both carving off time from your very busy schedules to, uh, to share some fantastic insights and perspectives uh, with the group here. And echoing what Austin said, um, yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We feel very blessed again for individuals joining us all throughout the world um, and know you'll get some very uh, helpful topics and ideas from this session today. And a few things that I just want to note is, please, we do have time set aside for a Q&A, um, but please feel free to have those questions rolling into the chat at any time through, throughout. Austin will be monitoring them. We'll do our best to get to all of them uh, so that we can help you further think through how VR, how the wild could be supportive of your experiential design process as well. So kicking off this conversation, um, Ryan and Ryan, maybe I'll just share with the group uh, a bit more of what type of, of, of work on a daily basis your team is specializing in and why experience is so important to it. Sure. Uh, you know, we do projects of all different sizes and scales. Uh, we do um, both architecture, interior design, and we have engineering component. Um, you know, we uh, do new build, new construction uh, for large destination resorts and hotels, uh, spas. Uh, but we also uh, pride ourselves in being uh, fantastic transformation artists when we uh, reposition hotels or uh, 
sort of um, uh, upgrade them or, or, you know, replenish or refresh them. There's a lot of different uh, terms for that. But um, yeah, we'll take a 45 year old hotel and, and take it from, you know, a dusty old uh, shuttered building uh, like we're doing now in San Antonio and make it something brand new and special and better than it ever actually even was in its uh, earliest uh, form possibly. So uh, we do those things both inside and out. Uh, we, you know, we obviously do our, our, our uh, inceptual, conceptualization all the way to um, inception, inception. So, you know, it is um, beginning to end for us and we do, you know, our own CA, Ryan does a bunch of that and we travel all over the world having a blast doing this. And, um, you know, we, uh, we have offices in many, many places and um, all different types of skill sets that we use to accomplish these things. So um, I think, uh, you know, Ryan, you want to add something on that I miss anything? No, I mean, that was, that was pretty good. And, and you know, when, when talking about that, the critical nature of the experiences, a lot of times that's what the clients come into us with is they want, they have a goal in mind, they have a vision in mind. So us understanding the experience that they're hoping to achieve through the product is, um, you know, where we start and um, what we have to carry through to the design and, and really make um, from an idea into something that actually gets built. And so, uh, like Ryan was saying, from start to finish, it's, it's really about how do we transition that experience into something real. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's a great, a great backdrop for us to dive into a bit, bit deeper. And you know, when we think about just the AE industry, um, right? I mean, let's call it the elephant in the room. It has been traditionally a very 2D driven driven world in, in a lot of lot of ways and we know that's not going going away uh, nor nor are we saying we it should but when i think about experience and the type of work that you all specialize and bring bring to life I, i'm curious if there are aspects of 2d that has made it ineffective and, and how you all in the past maybe tried to collaborate share ideas and and has 3d vr really allowed that experience to be more up to the expectations you all want for your clients yeah, short answer is yes, uh, obviously. I think uh, when it's done well, right? But I think uh, the thing that I've seen happen over the past two decades or so of my career is, you know, people were still doing uh, watercolors and, and to, you know, sketch perspectives and trying to do 3D um, modeling in a very sort of, I'll say, rudimentary form in the late 80s and, and 90s. And if a client wasn't a 3D thinker and couldn't think in perspective, which not everybody does see things and think that way, you had to over explain concepts, right? So you had to have a floor plan, you had to have scale models, uh, you would have interior elevations, exterior elevations, and you really had to kind of uh, bridge the gaps and the things that were maybe missing from their imagination. Other clients, we could bring a finished model and they could see it and get it and they, you know, just move right on. I love it. Keep going, right? Let me keep the model. That was my favorite one. We're going to keep the model. But you know, a few renderings would help um, or some fantastic sketch perspectives and watercolors. And what we saw, you know, I, I'd say in the early aughts was that people started using programs to give a little bit better perspective, a little bit better, um, I'll call it immersive um, perspectives and, and seeing projects from the inside and at the ground level and then flying above them. And so that was something that was always out there, but it was quite expensive, right? And it was very labor intensive. So when our clients want to see a hotel guest room that we've designed or, or a world-class lobby or, you know, a beach bar on the beach in the place that we're, we're creating this, this space, it, it's really kind of hard to take them there, right? So now with what you guys have and, and, and you know, these immersive tools in the wild and, and others is we can do the real-time capture with our, our, our iPhones. We can put the headset on and be on site, right? We can put our model in the space and as our content um, develops um, and 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 we iterate it, it it they see progress and they see it real time so it's not just a plan it's not just an elevation it's not just a perspective you know, the only challenge is they get to nitpick every little detail because it's all right there in front of you so we have to be careful what we draw right fantastic fantastic oh yeah Ryan see please yeah and we we spend I mean our our job is to communicate the ideas to the client and so any opportunity, you know, we spend a lot of time transitioning from 2D drawings to 3D perspective views to immersive technologies. And so the less time that we're spending transitioning between these different formats and the closer we are to getting that, um, what Ryan was saying, the, that um, more closer to reality view to the clients, it, it shows them more um, and it, it eliminates some of the communication errors that can happen where, you know, we see, we're used to seeing plans every day, but some of our operators, some of our clients, they're not. 
Um, they're used to seeing the world around them as you normally see it. So the closer we can get to that, the easier it is for our job as communicators to get our point across to them and avoid any confusion and avoid any um, you know, miscommunication along the way. Mm. Interesting. No, very interesting. And, and a few things that, that jumped out to, to, to me there. One, the last piece you said, Ryan, C about your job as, as communicators. Um, I've, heard, I've heard many organizations view VR as an empathy engine, just a way to really fully ensure that they're encompassing what they're hearing from their clients and them, you all on your end are able to really take and bring that vision to life in the clearest, crispest way to make sure that we're moving things in, in the right direction. But I think I also heard too, and do correct me if I'm wrong here, that um, having to jump from 2D to 3D back to 2D, which has been some for some organizations, the traditional approach has created some, some lag or some, some static uh, communication. Uh, did I follow that correctly or was I mis misinterpreting that? No, I don't, I don't think that's the case for me. Is that the case for you, Ryan? Well, I, yeah, and with the, the kind of distilling, like you said, AJ, like we're not getting rid of 2D drawings, we're not getting rid of any of these, they're all tools, right? And so we want to use the tool that, um, you know, breaks down the barriers of communication the most. And so um, what we found with the clients that we're working with um, is that the more immersed we can get them into a space, um, in the format that you're there used to seeing, the, the better communication and feedback we can get from them. Um, you know, and then you get into the issues that Ryan was saying, you know, um, where they start to nitpick things, but you'd rather have them get to that level, um, you know, than uh, not understand it completely. So Ryan, I'll give your thoughts on that. But. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think we're, it, it's one of the tools that, you know, not every uh, tool or, or medium or platform is for everybody. I think we mentioned a few months back that we quit trying to tell people what the wild was and we just showed them what we had. Mm -hmm. So we have 2D plan work with an elevation right above it and a 3D model in the space and my sketches, right? So like we put it all in the space and it just happens to be um, a landing spot. You know, we're not trying to explain the technology anymore. We're not even trying to put a headset on everybody because we have the desktop mode. So we are, I guess, um, immersing people to the extent necessary, if that makes sense. It sounds like a gateway uh, thing, but, but like it, it, the t yeah. I, I'd say to the extent that they can handle it, because sometimes they see the animations and, and that we would just do out of other platforms and they'd be like, okay, fine, that's good. So they don't need to be immersed, right? But then at the same time, we're kind of like, well, with our teams, it's better for our teams to be together when we can't be together. And it, it flushes it out for us rather than needing it for the client sometimes. So there's just multiple, uh, multiple, I'll say like a, a, a theaters, right? Or arenas where Ryan and I can be in the space and hear each other setting up the room virtually and working on um, things that we need to communicate to the team or things that we need to have done to a model in the space, but not be in a 2D environment on our uh, Bluebeam session and, and Microsoft Teams, right? So that's there's there's different immersive pieces to it, I guess, that are more valuable. Some are more valuable than others, but you know we still have to draw the way we draw until everybody's you know building with uh, you know some sort of see through virtual reality headset. Certainly. Certainly, and we're almost to a point too for the larger group of just uh, showing some some ideas mm -hmm. as opposed to talking about it. But the last question I have, and we will start to transition to to headset together, is: Have you found that sessions in in the wild and VR have, have brought more focus to the conversation? I think we all can agree. And funny because we're on Zoom here today, right? But Zoom, Teams, Slack, whatever it may be, there's a lot of fatigue from meeting that that way. Any perspective or thoughts you have there? I mean, Ryan just kind of said it, um, and I, I think said it really well. You know, we're sitting here on, on Teams, and you don't know if I have a web browser up or I got my phone in front of me or my watch is beeping at me. And even as we get back to the office, there's a lot of distractions with people around you. And when you start to get into the space in the headset, you, you kind of, um, uh, I'll overuse the word, but you're immersing yourself in that space. And so what Ryan was talking about, there's a lot of the, the benefit that we're seeing when we're just setting up the room, bringing assets into the space where we're talking because we're solely focused on bringing that stuff in. And, and that's where we start to um, spend a little bit more focused time to, to use that word and um, where we're not distracted by some of the other things going on around us so that 
our attention is 100% on the project while we're in that space, setting it up, working in there, collaborating in there. Yeah, and, and I agree. I think the thing that popped into my mind when, when you asked the question and then when Ryan was talking was, um, you know, our clients are in a, a lot of them are in a, in, in, in a one end of the spectrum or the other. They're either blown away and they can't, they, they just think it's fantastic and they accept it as is and they're thrilled or they get it and they want more and more and more as fast as possible, right? So both are great as long as they're not, you know, telling us to leave or, or, or getting rid of us. But, but the challenge for us, I think with the focus is we want to focus the client's attention, right? On certain things at certain times and not look at the whole project, right? So we can break it up and compartmentalize it. But then I think when we want to focus our either a particular team or our, or our own focus, much like we used to when we rolled out Trace and we were sketching over a set of plans or sketching over a 3D perspective, uh, we can focus on that intently or intensely. Same thing when we get into the space for the wild. If we're talking about a piece of the building, because we have the headset and the blinders on and we're not listening to music or our phone's not on or the, you know, like Ryan said, there's not multiple screens pinging and dinging. Like we are able to get intensely focused for a, a brief period of time and then come out of the computer, right? And, and then go do something else and leave that as a thing for others to come and, and sort of see and, and, and take in and comment and then make, make modifications or adjustments or contribute. And then we don't all have to be there together at the same time, but we can do it collectively sort of depending on what the good time for us is. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, on that note, let's go have some uh, focus time together, shall we? I'm gonna hop <laughs> sure. in a headset in Austin. I think you have sure. a, a, a poll question for the group if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely, yeah. So while we're, well, as you'll see, the rest of the guys here are gonna be transitioning into virtual reality. What we're going to do is we're kind of curious about who are you? Why are you here? Where are you calling from? If you wouldn't mind actually popping in the chat. Uh, I see we have a couple of people calling in from interesting locations. We have Russ Martin from Spinview, Hertfordshire, UK, as well as Jake Cressman from Google Machine Learning at Hillsborough, Oregon. I'm curious who's calling in for the most exotic location here today. And in addition, what we're also going to be doing is launching a poll here uh, just to kind of get a little brief background on what your perception of VR has meant to your firm today. There are a couple stages that we've talked about in these preliminary conversations with both Ryans of how they've used VR. But for you specifically, do you primarily view VR as made for rendering, prototyping, collaboration, presentations or interviews, or even BIM review? We'll give a couple minutes for answering this poll. I'll leave this hanging open as AJ and Ryan's are transitioning into VR. And in the meantime, I'm gonna be going ahead and sharing a screen of the wild with you all, which is that immersive collaboration platform we were just talking about. And we're gonna be joining them in this session to get together as if we were seeing things straight through their eyes all at once. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up my window here You'll be seeing a desktop view of the wild here. And we're going to jump into this space, the Lincoln Center, and see their avatars popping right up in there, very quickly loading this workshop view. And wow, what a space we've got there. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Howdy. <laughs> welcome into, uh, yeah, for all those you know, uh, on the call here today that have never been into the wild, welcome into uh, the workshop or, or the Cobra Kai Dojo, if you will. and. Uh, Yes, quite the space indeed. Again, Ryan and Ryan, thank you for sharing this with us and really just interested to kind of hear how this has become part of the experiential design process. Maybe you both can walk us through the room a little bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get us started and then um, Ryan jump in, um, you know, as we need to, or AJ ask a question or just tell me to be quiet. But we're, we're kind of starting at the middle here. You know, this is a, a wonderful little project that we were I'm happy enough to win at the beginning of the pandemic. It's called Hilton Lincoln Center. And um, it's a 45 year old office building complex that needed to, that has a hotel right in the middle of it. And uh, part of our pursuit is on the wall over there. But this model was a BIM model that the team built based on um, existing drawings that we got during the pandemic. We had no uh, site visits. The team was all working remote. But we built this model because we were adding this ballroom that you'll see here, big 7,000 square foot ballroom. We were working on the, the pork share over on the, on the front side of the building. And then we redid all these guest rooms and guest room corridors and then added a bunch of fun stuff on the inside of the building. 
Um, but the first part, so this is sort of the middle of the end, but the first part was us um, getting our head around how we were going to pursue the work and how we were going to communicate our vision to the client. So um, we had the idea to virtually pin up with our, our friend here. This was her idea, but we had the idea to put the, the boards on the wall, much like we would do um, in uh, our office when we were all working together and have a pinup session. And this is, uh, you know, a bit of a, a, a one version of it or a snapshot in time of us talking about the slides that we did or didn't want to use to communicate that vision uh, for, you know, uh, the, the work if we were, you know, fortunate enough to be awarded, which we were. So this was uh, an example of that charrette process. But you can see up on the top right, you know, the guys were teaching us the wild while we were using this. So we had the ability to use uh, voice notes. We learned to sketch in 3D. We learned to put slides uh, in different order and pull them in and out. And we had to kind of learn uh, how to load content, whether it be a PDF or whether it be um, 3D geometry. So, um, you know, it became our virtual space and, and uh, uh, you know, an environment for us to be together and hear each other's voices without staring at a 2D uh, PDF, you know? Certainly, certainly. Nice. So it's, for you all had started as early as the pinup the charrette, and correct me, what I'm looking at here is that it's really supporting multiple phases or areas of your you know, communication and internal design workflow. Is that a, a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, it's graphic design, but it's also thinking about the next phase, but it's our, our visual communication um, uh, uh, you know, as a layout, if you will, beyond just one page at a time, and then looking at the collective body of work and you know, being able to hear each other defend or uh, you know, get, get rid of a page um, as a group is important compared to just seeing uh, a big red X. You can hear why we got rid of a slide and have, you know, either leave a voice note in the middle of the night, depending on where you are, or add content like you'll see on some of the other parts of the room. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, this is, is, is great. What's the next, uh, where would you take us next into uh, so, here? <laughs> yeah, so when we, part of that though, you know, was us sketching our ideas about the project, right? So some of these sketches right. were, towards the end of us putting our presentation together. So what the backside of the ballroom, um, when it, you know, when it comes up out of the ground, you know, these are early phase sketches over the building. Uh, this is the new lobby looking out over uh, the lake that they have there. And this is coming forward to the portico share. So those were some of the areas that we thought um, their time and energy would be best uh, spent uh, aside from just the guest room piece, which was uh, quite a lot of work, but um, the, the new sort of fun guest experience and, and impactful moments were, you know, these slides that, um, you know, we wanted to have uh, them, you know, feel uh, what we were uh, dreaming about and, and thinking about as far as um, telling their story. So we brought those into the space and part of the, the next round of communication with the team here is, guys, we got the job. Congratulations. Now we have to deliver. So we had people you know, on site virtually scanning the, the spaces and and you know, validating that things were built the way that the drawings say they were built over the last you know 45 years or modified. And then as we you know sort of were able to look at these, we could say, look, we're changing the bollards, we're changing the ground plane, we're adding the ceiling lights and the new soffit, we're adding you know accents around the door, we're making the doors bigger and prettier, all new glass, and we're adding some elements at the top of the columns. And so that conversation rolled into these five things. Sorry. You guys can probably still hear me, but you can't see me. Yes. And, well, and one of the so, one of the neat things about like the way that we used some of these original these first two steps that we're walking through is it's it's a process and a format that we're used to. It's just in a different um, avenue, right? So we all do pinups. You know, we all are used to this level of critique, and for us, this was a way. Um, you know, at, at the time in the pandemic when we couldn't get together to do pinups. Um, you know, this became a tool that we could use to, to bring that back into our workflow. So we could do these pinups virtually and, and operate the way that we're comfortable doing as designers. Um, and we're also seeing that as everybody's getting back into the office, um, you know, our offices collaborate, you know, we're working with a firm and or working with other offices at Leeway Daily in Los Angeles and West Palm Beach on some of these larger projects. And it's a way for us to kind of uh, congregate together in those um, work sessions. Yeah, no, I, I think that's an important point to, I mean, certainly during the pandemic, right? When we were all getting used to whatever normal meant, but even the new normal, right? Some people will never be going back into, into the office, but 
even even so, with organizations like Leo A. Daily and others having you know, multiple office spread throughout the country, can this be a way to bring offices, bring people together in a richer, more dynamic way than traditionally how it's been done? And I'm hearing that you're you're seeing you know valuable valuable uses of it across the board there as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Can you guys hear me again? Yeah, I think I snuck up behind you, Ryan. But I think the funny thing I was doing while I I, enjoy, I got to watch you guys, I love it. The um, I left on purpose. But the thing that you do when we do presentations 2D a lot, Ryan, you you have that button you push to make the uh, the cursor kind of blink, so we can tell people mm -hmm. like look right here, look right here. And what I saw when I snuck up behind you, watching you guys, is like you don't have to make the cursor blink. You can call everybody's attention, which AJ does when I start walking around and doing other things. He brings us all together and our little bottom half of our bodies, you know, weave in the wind, which cracks me up, but you can, you can call everybody's attention to the thing that's very important. And you don't have to wonder if they're paying attention because they are, because you call them over there. Now they can wander off again, but, but the thing is you can, you know, draw on the space, right. And you can, you know, get rid of things and say, no, that's off the table. This is what I want you to look at. And then you start either circling it with a sketch or you start masking it. Exactly. So um, I think that's what, you know, also has been incredibly valuable for us. This corner over here might be a good segue to that if, if you guys want to uh, yeah. look at it real quick. So if we jump past the sketches and we jump past winning the project, you know, we um, we have uh, lots of different tools. So the middle of the, of the page here is, you know, us starting to do our 3D modeling and Revit. And starting to look at you know how the big buildings that I talk about in the background, how the new building comes out of the ground, how it hits the ground, and so we get past the demo stage and we have our intervention of our new building. And you know, in context, what that looks like was kind of important, and we had to talk about how does it not look like a spaceship just landed, and how do we make it look like it's a part of the context, the old buildings mixed with the new. Um, and you know, we went through an iterative process with the client. When we go have those presentations or when we have them virtually, we still have to bring it back to the team or we, we get to bring it back to the team and say, you know, they gravitated towards this image and this informs the trellis and the shade structure. They gravitated to this material skin way up high and that is informing this sketch here. And so these right. notes, these notes are just words, right? But then they also talk about the specific systems. And then this was just stone for a while, but then eventually, you know, we, we had conversations about what kind of stone and we got to show it to the client. We finally could meet physically with them. And it went from, you know, this building where um, it, there was metal coming into stone and a little bit of metal out here and different pieces of glass. So then we were able to say, again, we need to focus on these connections and these pieces of the buildings and blow it out and say, these are the details that we're trying to get. And this is the way we're trying to filter light. And this might be a cool outdoor room off of this space because it's nothing today. And then, you know, we pin these up to kind of, again, show the evolution, which was here, this connection was a little too tight and the building wasn't big enough. You know, future phase, it pooched out a little bit. The, the, the shade structure got a little less crazy. It got a, you know, recess in the facade with a beautiful reveal around it, all kinds of tailored stone elements. We gave, you know, we just kept giving it love and giving it love and nurturing it and making it, you know, uh, sort of evolve and be, um, you know, a better version of itself. But that happens in this corner. And we, you know, we, there's probably, you know, four different versions of this corner that you're not seeing there in other environments, but that's been a good kind of, I'll call it a hangout for us. Cause yeah. I can say, will you meet me in the wild over in the corner where we're talking about the ballroom and, and everybody knows where that is. Uh, mm -hmm. But if somebody needed to be in the other corner working on another piece, like the entry that we were just talking about, they could do that. Or if they weren't wild people like the technology, not, you know, the personality, then they could do it in another platform and show it to us however they got to the end, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. No, there's so much uh, good piece of um, pieces of advice there. And, you know, I think it is worth asking the question and I'm sure it's something on the minds of, of people that are on this, this call today is, you know, VR does still very much face the, the, you know, stereotype for, for teenagers is for playing, playing games. But when rubber meets the road, where is it really consolidating efforts or um, creating business returns for an organization? I'd be curious to hear your, your respective thoughts on that topic. Ryan, you want to you answer that and tell them about how we put the VR headset on the client? Yeah. And one of the neatest things, one of the, our first actually interactions using VR or in the wild specifically with, 
with the client was on this project specifically. So after we had gotten to a certain point where we had the model developed um, to a level where we were comfortable having the client jump in it, um, we, we set them up in there. We got them involved and over into the model that you're seeing over on the table over there. And um, you know when we were able to get them in there, uh, it really took her understanding of the project from just the 2D drawings and the, the flat images that we were showing to understanding the space. And um, we had her standing in the pre-function of this ballroom and said, all right, look around, do you see where this is existing? Now we're gonna put you in the headset. We're gonna show you what this will be. Um, and for her, that was kind of an aha moment where um, we were able to get that level of buy-in. Uh, to me, I think a lot quicker. And especially with, you know, we've been seeing it with, um, you know, some of these projects, just the timelines, everybody's got projects and working on deadlines. So getting feedback, getting buy on from the owner is so important. So any, any way that we can get that sooner is allows us to be more effective at documenting that, continuing with the design and moving forward. So we're not hanging out and waiting for decisions. We can get decisions quicker by, um, you know, immersing the client into um, this environment. And that, that was so true when we were able to do that for this Hilton Lincoln Center project. Yeah, and, and her question was, where are all the materials? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was right, right, the, the <laughs> animation. This is kind of the animation of that, the, yeah. that project at that stage. And she was like, well, but it's not all white. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, <laughs> we're gonna get there, you know, so. Fantastic, fantastic. And, you know, too, just thinking, appreciate you both so much for walking us through the room. So many wheels in my head turning here, but also, you know, I'm practical in the fact too, that, you know, as a practicing team, you know, you have, you're, you're working on multiple projects, have multiple clients. So how do you quickly shift from one environment to the next? And I believe you all brought in a, um, another kind of a lobby for us to hop over to. I think this would be a good spot for us to hop over if you guys are good. Yeah, drag us over there. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna use our uh, tool to gather everyone right out in front of me here really fast so I'm not having to uh, reach. And let's go ahead and uh, I like to think of it as butterfly catching. I'm gonna go ahead and get Ryan C, Ryan M, then myself. And, Let's, uh, yeah, let's hop down down in. And while we're doing so, maybe you can uh, provide a little back context, gentlemen, on what we are looking at here. Yeah, are you gonna pull us, I'll, I'll talk and then I guess you can pull us down and it'll, it'll hear us. But so this, while this is the lobby, um, this is the lobby portion of a 300 acre uh, resort that we started to uh, reposition during the pandemic. So uh, it's in Anguilla, uh, it's called Aurora. Um, and you know it has come about over time, and you know we had the the good fortune to go over and see it um, before we were able to uh, work our magic and and start to you know uh, really sort of roll up our sleeves and have a major impact. But the the the, the lobby piece is is so impactful. It's, there's an image of it up here on the wall. I don't know if everybody's seeing it or not, but um, you know it did not look like that when we got there. Uh, the project had been through. Uh, the recession it had been through a, mult, a hurricane and it was a struggling uh, project in, in a beautiful beautiful amazing island in the Caribbean and so while all the other all the other resorts on the island were thriving this one which happens to have a world-class golf uh, golf course the only golf course on the entire island uh, just wasn't realizing its full potential so our clients bought it they brought us in to help them reposition it building by building um, and so this piece of it is the lobby. We have a few images over on the wall, but you know, I think uh, we said we were just going to get in the lobby. Yeah, come on down. Let's it. see how uh, how, how you all brought there. it to life here. Yeah, uh, I think that I'm trying to sit down, but I don't have any legs. Um, let's see. Let's <laughs> sit, my, let's sit, sit my waist here. Um, but I think the thing that we, the reason this one was important for us to bring in is because. Our team, um, you know, has grown uh, during the pandemic and has all, all kinds of different challenges. So uh, some of us were able to go to the property several times. Others, um, you know, were back home, uh, either not willing or not able to travel for different reasons. And so, um, you know, they modeled a lot of the project in 3D uh, based, again, on photos and on existing drawings. And this, lo this lobby model was a SketchUp model. Um, the Hilton Lincoln Center we looked at was a Revit model. And we learned through working with you guys and your team at the Wild that 
um, you know, we can bring all different types of product into the wild and we can bring in all different types of assets. And, you know, the, the ID team showed it, they showed up with this, uh, this rendering of our lobby that we built one day and we're like, holy cow, that is amazing. Like your rendering is great, but did you know we have a technology to get and, and be in the space and see it and sit in it? So it was a way of bringing them into the wild when they, you know, maybe weren't all the way uh, wild people yet. And then just, again, enhance our, our process, enhance our project, enhance our deliverable, um, and sort of, you know, get more bang for the buck because they built that model you know, to have a better understanding of the size, scale, proportion, proportion and, and of the space, but they were not in it first person. They were in it in a viewer mode of a modeled animation. So, you know, th that's, this is one of those spaces um, that we thought was pretty, pretty fantastic. But um, I think that answers your question. No, absolutely. And I, I love too, how you have like these images just sitting on the, the table here. I'm, I'm picturing you bringing a client in here, one, allowing them to truly feel that one-to-one -one scale, but then having just these nice supplemental pieces to help your support your story and kind of blend understanding, whether it be one-to-one, -one, 2D, it's bringing all these different pieces together in a, you know, an all-inclusive in environment. If, if you yeah, I think, you know, I, I haven't done this, you know, we didn't, we didn't probably rehearse this part of this, but you can see here, I, I can not only have this, but I can kind of present it like Vanna White to you, right? And I can say, there's before, and here's where we want to go. And oh, by the way, if you turn around, there's the third version. If you look towards Ryan C, that's where the bar maybe sort of ended up, right? And I think it's even more beautiful than that today, but we turned it from these colors and finishes that were not great to uh, uh, we distilled it down and then ultimately did a bunch of cool built-in pieces and so on. And you can see here on this, you know, case opening and these, you know, different portals to different spaces, we kind of layered on uh, a color and texture and really just kind of had to add some richness to the project. It was incredibly white and austere. Uh, they didn't have ceiling fans, but you know, if, if you're not, if we're not digging that or we don't want to talk about that anymore, you know, we can talk about the other side of the same building and I can flip this thing around. Thank goodness there's no gravity in here, right? But I can see what the lobby spaces look like and how we had this chandelier that we had to get uh, away from. You can see the beautiful view that if I had done the reality capture uh, out on the left, uh, over my left virtual shoulder here, you would see that view um, is, is, you know, we're sitting in the space on either side of that. So, you know, we, that's kind of what we want to get more and more of is, is plugging these pictures in and being able to do a virtual before and a virtual after um, instead of, you know, like now we're just kind of playing with, uh, you know, images on the table, which is cool. But, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, I can't believe nobody's thrown anything today. Is it okay if I throw this? I want to chunk yep. it. <laughs> now that I say it, now there is gravity. <laughs> you throw it. <laughs> I think one of the things too that we like uh, with with this space and jumping in here is we had so many conversations with the client. Um, you know, sensitive to budget, we're we're showing a lot of furniture in this space, and so the client always had the question of like, do we need all that, or is this going to be way too crowded, or you know, is this going to seem like a, a gallery for furniture and everything spaced out? Like, how does it actually feel in the space? And so, you know, when we're able to jump in here, we can see that, you know, there isn't too much furniture. And, you know, we were able to iterate on, on the placement and arrangement because sometimes in 2D, when you're looking at the FFA layout and plan, you don't quite get the scale of the space um, and, and how much furniture is too much or how much furniture is too big. Or, or are we, you know, well underdressing the space? Are we overdressing it? Those kind of conversations become a little bit more um the meaningful when we're down in this environment at scale sitting at the table talking about like you know this feels comfortable sitting here with other people yeah. um, and we, we we don't feel like we're right on top of other seating groupings and things like that so for the client it's a little bit better to understand are we overspending on things like that uh, no i mean and, and thank you all for shedding some light of, of where you see taking this technology uh further and, you know, to um, looking at the, the, the time, I'm sure there's a lot of individuals on this call. I mean, they attended for a reason, like maybe they're thinking of going, getting going with, with VR, but there's some hesitation. What, what piece of advice would you give to individuals that are thinking about this that haven't, haven't done it, done it yet? 
mine, you know, sounds a little bit probably like Nike or whatever, but it's 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 a little bit like when we have uh, writer's block or designer's block. You have to, you know, pick up a pen and, and start writing, uh, start drawing, uh, start creating. And I think um, for virtual reality for us, it was get the headset, put it on, start getting your VR legs. Um, you know, the guys at our firm that were already doing it um, were, you know, telling us you got to spend time in the headset. You got to go. Uh, play a few games. You got to, you know, knock a few holes in the wall because you're getting into it. You got to bang your hand on the table. You got to play, you know, watch some movies and start to understand the menus. Yeah, there you go and grab stuff and play with it. Um, but, you know, we had to, we had to, you know, ease into it, right? So learning how to break it um, with you guys as our backstop was very, very helpful. Um, and anybody who knows me knows I wouldn't say that if I didn't mean it. And it's just like you guys have always been there as a resource. Um, and, and then, you know, the more we use the program, the more we realize what it's great for. And then when we need to not use the wild, when we need to go use something else. Sure. So I would say get in there and start doing it. The barriers to entry are quite low. Um, the cost is, I think, very, very reasonable. Uh, we did it at our firm as a research grant so that we could get the funding and sort of build up some speed rather than starting with a, a huge uh, spend. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's been something that we share uh, across offices and, we send the headsets all over the place and, you know, I think it's, it's fantastic. And, and it's uh, sort of 21st century, even though it sounds goofy to say that 20 years in. <laughs> Most definitely. Most definitely. Well, why don't we do this gentlemen? Um, why don't we hop back on to the, uh, the, the video or add a headset and address some of the questions that came from the group. If that sounds, sounds good. Sure. Sure. All See right. you there. <laughs> All right, we are back. Put that off to the side so I don't bump into it. But no, that was absolutely fantastic, uh, gentlemen. And um, I'm very confident in saying people took so much from that. And Austin, uh, I'm curious, what are some questions that have come to light from the group? So we actually don't have any questions in the Q&A right now. And just to give another little window, if, in case there is anything that's on your mind, whether it's something you've seen from asking AJ about the wild or even the work that you just saw in this space with both Ryans, feel free to drop that in the Q&A button. Uh, but AJ, maybe in the meantime, do you have any other closing remarks or final questions to wrap up while we are blessed with the presence of both Ryans here? Yeah, you know, I, I guess too, uh, gentlemen, maybe you could add, and you, you hinted at it a few times, Ryan M, that like, yes, we were in headset here today, but you've, it seems like you've also found value in maybe initially introducing to people to not overwhelm them through, through the desktop piece, or maybe in the AR side, maybe you could add a little bit of color, what you've seen there. Yeah, Ryan, you go ahead. I've talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it, yeah, a lot of people there, you know, with what Ryan was saying, we always recommend just get into it, but some people still have a little bit of hesitation. So to um, put them in front of a screen where they can just watch what we're doing, um, it, it helps us still control what people are focusing on. And so we can walk around and interact as if we're standing in front of them through the screen. Yeah, um, and it, it helps us to guide, you know, like that little blinky pulsing light, you know, what we do on our presentations. But it, it shows them a little bit more at scale with us walking around um, without them having to go full bore. So it, it gives them a little glimpse into what this could be. Um, and that's kind of what we've done uh, as well. Do you, want me to add, do you want me to answer Matt's question, Austin? Uh, or try yeah, to? Absolutely, go for it. <laughs> yeah, so the, the question from Matt Norton um, is what resistance did you get from clients about getting into headsets? And I think initially for me, because uh, we mentioned we got into this in the pandemic, so it was like, is this headset clean enough for this client? Um, I want to make sure that it's sanitary. You're laughing, Ryan, but I'm not a filthy person. But um, I just wanted to be sensitive because that was, you know, a time to be sensitive. And so I, you know, brought wipes and I was like, this has, you know, been sanitized. And if you're comfortable, we'd like for you to put it on. But, you know, it's the same thing as handing somebody a gun. Maybe it's never shot a gun. You want to let them know what they're getting into and say, Okay, you're going to see uh, a 3D environment, right? What does that mean to some people? So there's a bit of the fear of the unknown once you get past the germ thing. I think some people have issues with glasses, right? So there's a, an insert that comes with the Oculus for dealing with glasses. That's a thing. 
Um, and then not knowing how to manipulate the handles uh, or the tools, that's not it, it, the most intuitive thing if you don't play video games, for example. So we kind of had to like get her into it and get her walking around and then she just took off, right? And she was early 40s, mid 40s and, and just brilliant and a quick study. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want somebody to have um, like uh, some sort of, you know, claustrophobia or seizure issue or whatever. So I think easing into it in a 2D desktop and saying like, here's my, my screen, I'm going to be right next to you, I'm going to be in the environment with you, uh, Ryan's at the office, he's going to be in the office with you, those are things that have helped get past that resistance, but some people are, it's generational, they're like, I don't care about that stuff, I don't want to do video games or virtual reality, I like re my reality just the way it is, and we kind of just have to laugh it off and go, okay, great, thanks, you know, it, it's not for you, but uh, maybe it's for the people, other people on your team, you know, and, and I think when you start telling them about the capabilities of you know watching netflix on a cinema size screen in in your in your house you know like you don't have to go anywhere and and explaining to them the landing spaces that you can come into the environments that helps get past that resistance but for me it was fear of the unknown and then also a little bit of the germaphobe and sort of claustrophobic issue so hopefully that answers your question matt i think on that right like that wasn't the first time um that our client had heard us talk about the wild so we didn't show up one day and say, hey, we're going to get you in a headset. Like they had been exposed to it other ways without getting the headset on first. So it was a little bit of gradual steps to get them there um, so that it wasn't just like this wave of here you go, put the headset on. Yeah. No, great question. Yeah. Thank you both for, for adding color to it. And knowing we're right up uh, against uh, time here, let me again thank you both for um, you know, all you do, your, the beautiful work your teams produce and sharing these fantastic ideas uh, with, the, with the group uh, and to the group as a whole that joined us. Thank you for making the time work and joining us on our, our mixed event. We look forward to having you more so upcoming. And uh, again, if you are wanting or thinking about getting, getting started, um, Ryan M mentioned it that uh, the stars truly have aligned when it comes to VR and how it can fit into to your workflow. And we're trying to help on that front as an organization as well with a current promotion that we have going for any organization that uh, purchases a subscription of, of the wild. Uh, you'll get um, you'll get a free Quest 2 headset um, on or before that purchase on December 11th. Um, certainly, too, for those organizations that are joining us in the states here today, you may want to have your certified uh, financial advisor, CPA. Let me make the statement. I, we at the Wild are not uh, a financial advisor or a CPA, but you may want to look into the Section 179 tax deduction. As the Wild is a purchase made for, for business use, uh, it is very possible that it will uh, um, apply to that tax deduction, which will allow your organization to write off the entire purchase price within this, this year. So another way to help lower the barrier from an investment standpoint that could be helpful to your firm. So on that note, I uh, want to wish you all a fantastic rest of the day, week. Thank you for joining us, Mixed with the Wild, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the wild here very soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, you guys. Bye.